Welcome, everyone, to our regular weekday morning podcast on Kabbalah for Heretics. With me, your heretic in chief, Yaakov Leib HaKohen. Just to bring you up to date, as I say every morning, we have been for the past 30 years, that's no exaggeration, every weekday morning, for the past 30 years, we have been systematically going through the Zohar, volume by volume, page by page, sentence by sentence, cover to cover. And uh, in this 30 years, we have so completed volumes one, two, three, and four, and just recently have begun volume five, the last volume of the Zohar. And uh, lest you think that means we're going to be finished soon, uh, let me uh, correct that. It's going to be another three or four, maybe five years <laughs> for us to finish volume five. God give me the life and the strength to do it. Well, with that in mind, let's get back to where we left off in our last podcast in volume five. And it says, as they were going along, they came across a man standing under a tree whose face was full of the marks of blows. Now, obviously, what they have done is come across Cain, referred to esoterically in the previous passage that we interpreted in our last podcast. For example, it, in the last section it says, as Rabbi Chia and Rabbi Yossi were once going along, they came to a field where there was a balsam tree on the right. And we interpreted that, the field being the field in which Cain killed Abel, the balsam tree being a lesser form of the ten sephirites. Now, this morning, it says, as they continued on, they came across a man standing under a tree. Well, now the tree has a man standing under it. Previously, it did not. And that man, clearly according to what we were discussing in our last podcast, is Cain. Why do we say that? Because it says they came across a man standing under a tree whose face was full of the marks of blows. The marks of blows, the mark of Cain. They noticed also that his face was all red from the blows. The descendant of Cain, who is Esau, is called also Edom, red. Edom, red. So there is this man, Cain, the forefather of Esau, being noted by the redness of the blows on his face. I might point out that uh, when I was born, um, 82 years ago, my face was red. And I was covered with hair, just like Esau. Said Rabbi Chia to him, who are you? He replied, I am a Jew. Now look, he asks him, who are you? And the very first answer he gives is not really to the question. But he says, I am a Jew. He was not asked, what are you? He asks, who are you? And he replies, I am a Jew. That is the totality of the identity 
of any Jew is that of Jew, not the religion. You have to understand that this, our talks in the Zohar is not about the religion of Judaism. It is about the psychic, supernal mind of the Jewish psyche. Now, I also want to point out something. Notice that there are two rabbis walking along and they discover this third person with the red face and they ask him, who are you? And he answers, I am a Jew. Think back to something else I've said before. One of the names of God is Adonai. Adonai, Lord. That name, Adonai, in Hebrew, is spelled Yud Yud. Just two letters spell Adonai. No vowels. Yud Yud. This is interpreted to mean elsewhere in oral Torah and by oral tradition that wherever there are two Jews, Yud Yud, there is the Lord Adonai. And so these two rabbis, when they are walking, just the two of them, and even when they meet the third person, are actually carriers of Adonai. Who are you? He said, you. And he replied, I am a Jew. That explains why he gives an answer that is not entirely appropriate to the question. Because the voice asking, who are you, is not these two rabbis. But the Lord, who are you? And then appropriately he responds, I am a Jew. That is how he responds to the Lord Adonai, who is present because there are two Jews, Yud, Yud, encountering him. He replied, I am a Jew, said Rabbi Yoisi. Listen now. He must be a sinner, or otherwise his face would not have all those marks. And these are not what are called chastisements of love. Further telling us that this man standing there is Cain, a prefiguration of Cain, but Cain. And the two rabbis who encounter him and are questioning him are really Adonai. So this is a conversation between Adonai, the Lord, and Cain, the sinner. Now, occasionally, the rabbis who collectively represent Adonai will say something, as we see here. Said Rabbi Chia, not Adonai, but Rabbi Chia. Assuredly, that is so. For the chastisements of love are hidden from view. There is a famous quote in the Zohar, several times, I believe. He whom God loves, he afflicts with suffering. That is a reference to the chastisements of love. He whom God loves, the Zohar says, he afflicts with suffering, which will leave marks on one's, on one's person on one psyche. Rabbi Ki is saying, no, you're right. Those are not the marks of love on this man. They are not the marks of love. And the other, Rabbi Ki says, assuredly that is so, for the chastisements of love are hidden from you. The suffering that God inflicts upon those who love him are private personal, not public, at least in terms of the tzaddik being afflicted. He doesn't walk around talking about it all the time, you see, because he is a tzaddik. So with the plague of leprosy, of all those whose marks which are visible to all, it is written, and so the priest Aaron 
shall see and declare him unclean, unquote. Now, this is a direct analysis and explication of the written scripture that we started with, that this is a midrash on, when a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising or a scab or a bright spot, etc. I hope you're seeing I'm connecting the previous beginning of this midrash on that scripture with what we're reading now. So with the plague of leprosy, of which those marks are visible to all, as it is written, quote, and the priest shall see and declare him unclean, unquote. Now, leprosy has various esoteric meaning, but one of its most predominant meanings is that of lush and horror, evil speech. Those who practice evil speech about another for very precise reasons are lepers. For assuredly, those come from the side of uncleanness and are not chastisements of love. Le um, lush and horror, evil speech, comes from the left-hand side. It comes of God, the unclean side of God. And are visible by the people speaking it. Now, this gossip, evil gossip, is not as simplistic as you might think. There are volumes of commentary written about evil speech what commonly would be called gossip. That what you are doing when you do that is literally killing the soul of the person you are talking about and dragging the other to whom you are talking into the side of sin. Not just chatting about a friend who isn't there. Even if you're talking about him in the positive, it's a, the sin of lush and horror. Because eventually any discussion of an absent third person leads to evil speech. Two guys are talking about a third guy. Oh, yes, says one, he's my neighbor. And the other says, oh, what a fine man. And the other says, yes, indeed, he is a king among men. But you know... He is cheating on his wife, and they're off and running. Even though they started out positively, it eventually, always, inevitably, leads to evil speech. Lushen, I've seen Lushen Hora destroy whole spiritual movements. You know, when people in the movement begin... Uh, chattering at each other about a third person. Oh, you know, he doesn't really believe the way we do. And more commonly, about the leader of that movement. For example, you know, he's not always right. No, he's not. Even though he thinks he is. Do you see? I've, I've seen it in many instances. Russian horror never adds to a person or a movement. It always detracts from him and it. <clears throat> Assuredly that is so, for the chastisements of love are hidden from view. So with the plague of leprosy, so with the plague of evil speech, is what is really being said here, of gossip. It is a plague. Gossip. You and a friend casually talking about a third friend. Who isn't there? That is a plague. It's not what you think it is. It's not just chatting about somebody. It's a plague. It is killing that third person's soul. And it is dragging both of you into the left-hand side of sin. That may not be your intention. You may not be conscious of it. 
But the Zohar is telling us that's what's happening under the surface. That is what's happening on a spiritual plane. <clears throat> so with the plague of leprosy, of those marks which are visible to all, it is written, and the priest shall see and declare him unclean. Declare him unclean. Practicing Lushan Hora, idle gossip about an absent third person, is unclean. It is from the side of uncleanliness, the left hand side of God. So, with the plague of leprosy, of those marks which are visible to all, it is written, quote, well, of course it's visible to all, because the person practicing it is talking about it to all openly. For assuredly, those come from the side of uncleanliness and are not chastisements of love. In the same way, he who reproves his neighbor in love should not let other men hear in order that he may not be ashamed. It's one thing to criticize a person directly. There is no punishment in that. That is not leprosy. But the minute there is, you're declaring it to a third person about a person who is not there, that is a sin. That is the plague of leprosy. So it's not just having negative attitudes toward a person that constitute the plague of leprosy, Lushan Hora, evil speech. It is doing it to another person while the person you're talking about is absent. It's that action that is the sin, not necessarily what you're saying. You may be talking about the truth. But what makes it a sin, if indeed it is, is that you're doing it while that person is absent to another person. That's the sin. This has such relevance for today. I, I, cannot, I cannot emphasize strongly enough. Think about it. I know that in my own spiritual movement, uh, there was a time at the beginning when I taught on Lashon Hara, and really there were one or two people among the students listening who were greatly offended. They said, well, then what are we going to talk about? Meaning, the only thing they talk about is other people. They have nothing else to talk about. That's a plague among us now. I do my best to avoid that. In all my talks and writings, I do my best not to attack a third person who is not present. I don't always succeed because I am human. But at least that is my kavona. That is my intention. Not so much for myself, but for the sake of the person to whom I may be talking and for the sake of the person to whom we may be, about whom we may be talking. <clears throat> and it goes on. So with the plague of leprosy, of those marks which are visible to all, it is written, and the priest shall see and declare him unclean. Declare him unclean because he is practicing Lush and Hora evil speech for assuredly those come from the side of uncleanliness the left hand side the sitra achra, of God and are not chastisements of love they're not God's chastisements of love which come from the right hand side where one confronts the person directly and alone privately so it's not what you're saying so much about the person who is absent is that you're doing it at all. It's the act of talking about him while he's absent. That is the sin, not necessarily the content of what you are saying. Do you understand? 
These are harsh, difficult laws. As I said, there are whole volumes written by the ancient scholars about the sin of Lush and Hora. It's not as simple as you may think. In fact, there's a, there is a book in English that you can get called Lush and H Evil Speech. The book is called Evil Speech. Look it up. Buy the copy. You'd be amazed at what constitutes evil speech. For example, there is a form of evil speech where a person calls up another person and says to that person, did you know that so-and-so is plotting against you? That is evil speech because what you're doing is putting the person to whom you are telling this in an impossible situation. There's nothing he could do about it except become anxious. Anyway, so the forms of evil speech are complicated and many. Look to this in yourselves. Look to this in yourselves. I do. You're dealing with murder on a spiritual level when you practice gossip about a person who is not present. Murder of that person's soul and the destruction of your soul and the soul of the person who is innocently standing there listening to you. In this, these books, commentaries on gossip, it says, if you are with another person and he begins talking about a third person who is absent, you must leave immediately or you are participating, even though you're not the one saying it, in evil speech. Do you see how difficult it is? I mean, I have, in the past, when I wasn't quite such a recluse, I have been in situations where someone starts talking about a third person, and I say, I'll say, I said, I must leave. You're getting involved in Russian horror, and I must not be present. <clears throat> Think of the times that you are faced with that decision. And it's not just being mean. Lashonara is not just meanness. We want to uh, trivialize it by thinking of it, oh, it's just, what, what harm could it do? It's just gossip. Well, it does enormous harm. It does enormous harm, according to the Torah. It begins to kill the soul of the person you are speaking of and the soul of the person to whom you are speaking. Think of it. And the priest shall see and declare him unclean, for assuredly those who come from the side of uncleanliness and are not chastisements of love. In the same way, he who reproves his neighbor in love should not let other men hear it in order that he may not be ashamed. If you are reproving a person in love, criticizing him in love, you must not do it in public where others can hear. That's the practice of Lakshan Hara, which confirms that this entire passage we're reading is about the sin of Lakshan Hara, the plague of evil speech. And I hope I have brought it into your life for you to look at in yourself. We'll end here for this morning in our talk on evil speech, and we'll continue in our next podcast. In the meantime, in the meantime, let me mark my place, and let me ask uh, those 
people who are here, not as students, but as helpers in the recording, editing, and posting on our YouTube channel, these talks. Let me ask them if they have any comments or questions. Raise your hand if you do. Yeshai, go ahead. David, go ahead. Yisod and Tommy, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Remember, this is not and these are not classes. They are recording sessions of a podcast that is then broadcast on our channel on YouTube. So students are not invited, not to these recording sessions. They are invited to listen to these podcasts at any time on our YouTube channel. So when I ask the people who are here if they have any comments or questions, I ask because those comments and questions may very well reflect the kinds of comments and questions you who are in the listening audience may have. All right, Yeshaya and David, go ahead. David. David says, so with the plague of leprosy, of which those marks are visible to all, and the priest shall see and declare those from the side of uncleanliness. That is to say, Lushan Hora. When you speak of someone who is not there, even if positive, it leads to evil speech. Lushan Hora, evil speech, never adds to a person. It is a plague of leprosy, for it drags you and those parties into the left-hand side of sin. Perfect. I was thinking, said David, and I guess this is a question, that because of the power of the gateway of imagination, that when we speak of those who are not there, no, no, because you're talking to God. No, it's, not, it's not the same. Now, good question. Do you understand my answer? That's a good question, but no. That's not Lashon Hara. That's totally in the imagination. It's not directly talking about a third person with another. But it's a very good question, though, and, and a good comment. Thank you. So don't worry about, beside which, why would you be talking about another person in, in, in uh, imagination? to a third person. Why would you want to do that? Do you see? If you do it, it's not the sin of Lashon Hara. But why would you even want to do it? It's not like you're standing there with a living third person, with a, a person. You're not. You're talking with and having a conversation with God. Why would you want to practice gossip about someone with God? Do you get me? Do you get this latter point? You don't even want to do it. It isn't it isn't Lashon Hara if you do, but you shouldn't even want to do it. Thanks, David. Great comment, terrific question. I hope I've answered the question for you and everybody in the listening audience who may have the same question. You're welcome, David. Thank you. You're shy, go ahead. Waiting for your shy or your sod. If you have anything, just type it. <clears throat> Here we go, your shy. Powerful shear. Chastisements of the unclean shied show marks that the priest can see. Everybody can see it. The leprosy. The leprosy the Midrash began with. The chastisements of love is reproving privately. Evil speech kills the souls, dragging them into the unclean side, even if heard. So we must leave when it begins by others. Beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you, both of you. One last chance, you saw it. You got anything you want to say? Otherwise, we will... Do it as we do at the end of every podcast. Oh, there he goes. I knew. He said, supernova exegesis, studying the laws and conduct. Chofetz Chaim. 
<laughs> was a little challenge. It was a life-challenging experience. Our greatest concern is unifying God in our own being. Being drawn the road of lashes of lush and horror brings destruction in ways we may not even be aware of. You're welcome. Thank you for a great comment, Isad. Thank you. It's, that's absolutely true. Lush and horror divides where our task and our goal is to unify. But it also is murder. Literally, the book Evil Speech begins by stating that, that lush and horror, evil speech, gossip about a third person who is not present is murder and must be counted as that sin. Thank you, he said. Just great. Dovey, could you take your hand down unless you have something more to say? We, oh, okay. That would be fine if you did, but you don't. <clears throat> now, as also we do at the end of every podcast, I'm going to um, recite the sacred um, prayer for the dead, the Kaddish in memory of and to raise up the soul of our beloved friend, Leonard Cohen. And lest you say, well, isn't that lush and horror? Of course not. It's a prayer. It's a ritual prayer prescribed to be done by God. Eliezer, this is for you, beloved comrade. This could all be good, Ashmerabo, Bomo di Vroch, who say the Amlech Machuse, the Chayachon of Yomechon of Chaye, the Chal Basis Roel, Bagalot of his man, Korivim Romain, the He Shmerabo, the Verach, Lelomo Mel Maya, Yisparach, Vis Tabach, Vispar, Brisma, Savius, Adavius, Alevius, Alal. Shmedu Kutrabrihu, Lelomen Khabirachasa to Shwarasa, the Nechemasa Damiran Bomovim Ramain. Yehe Soma Rabba Min Min Shamaya, the Elenu via Ko Yisrael Vim Ramain. O say Shalom Bim Namov, who ya say Shalom, Elenu via Ko Yisrael Vim Ramain. Let everyone please say. Amen. Well, that brings us to the end of this morning's podcast. Thank you for listening. God willing, I will be able to have the life to do the next podcast. And God willing, you will have the consciousness of soul to attend by listening. In the meantime, Give a rock